today about Kosovo. My name is Justin Peace. I am working at the Balkan program here at the Institute. We have been following events in the region since the 1990s. Um, some of us have also worked and lived in the region, in Kosovo and in Serbia and Bosnia and other places. So it's a keen interest that we, we, we continue following uh, uh, the part of Europe which still is uh, somewhat troublesome, at least politically challenging. And the topic of today, of course, is Kosovo. Um, which status of Kosovo has been an issue maybe for about a hundred years? Uh, it was an issue during the old Yugoslavia. The question about Kosovo should have a status, a Republican Republic status, been um, within Yugoslavia or not? It was a controversial issue. And of course, when Milosevic turned from an Aparachi communist to a nationalist, it was in Kosovo, through Kosovo, uh, where it all happened. Uh, after NATO intervention in 1999, and Kosovo declared its independence in 2008, unilaterally. Um, things uh, got somewhat better in the sense that lots of countries, including Norway, recognized Kosovo as an independent republic. But of course, relations with Serbia were not normalized, and several EU countries also not. Well, at least a couple of EU countries did not recognize uh, Kosovo either. So it's obvious that for the future, uh, for the neighboring relations, uh, Kosovo-Serbia relationships need to be normalized somehow, at least find a common platform to agree to disagree and move on from there or something like that. Um, lately, as most of you probably know, there's been a very much high level diplomacy going on uh, under the auspices of the special representative uh, of the European Union in diplomacy, for uh, Madam Cathy Ashton. Um, she made the presidents meet each other, shake hands, stay with prime ministers, and this week, uh, the Serbian leadership were in, 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 in Brussels on Monday. Uh, yesterday, she was in Pristina and talked to Prime Minister, Min Minister Tachi and opposition parties and others. Then she flew on to Belgrade and met with the same Troika there. And today, they are here. The, the Kosovo leadership are here in Norway. So it's a very good timing for our, our uh, today's seminar. We're therefore extremely pleased to have the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Kosovo, Mr. Petit Selimi, here. He does speak fluent Norwegian because he studied here, but he will speak in English today, of course, because not all of you are Norwegians. He has been in his current position since 2011. Um, he's also national coordinator for the implementation of the regional co cooperation with Serbia. Uh, before joining uh, uh, the foreign ministry, he was an MP for the Democratic Party of Kosovo. Um, and he also worked as a private consultant the year before that. Um, about political risk and public you know, analysis. He was also one of the founders and first executive director of the Daily Express newspaper in, in Pristina, independent so. And he also worked in OSCE, which I also and others have done so, so, uh, in, in Kosovo, though. Uh, you have, as I mentioned, a bachelor from University of Oslo in uh, anthropology, and also a master from the Eleven School of Economics in media. We are very pleased to welcome you here to get us the latest updates on what's going on. Uh, and you will talk for about half an hour, something like that, and then you open, of course, for q &A. Thank you very much. For the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karsten. As I said, I'm going to continue with English, but thank you very much for all of you being here. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity to be in NUPI uh, as one of the platforms of foreign policy, which is uh, already world famous. Uh, quite a few of the foreign policy experts from Norway have uh, served here, and we are very happy to uh, be guests here. I will uh, speak a few minutes on where are we now, and I will not go deep into the Kosovo history, as usually we start uh, 100 years ago, uh, so I will presume that everybody knows what happened in the last uh, few wars, and it will start in a very recent, uh, let's say, last 12 months. Um, uh, we had a good 2012 uh, year uh, in foreign policy, as well as in European integrations, Euro Atlantic integrations. Uh, Kosovo in 2012 has been recognized by 13 countries, which has been an increase uh, in the number of recognition, but also in the geographical spread of recognitions with Pakistan in December and uh, Egypt in January confirming the recognition. Uh, we also started to sort of get into the core of the so-called old non-aligned movement, in which we had a little bit less movement in the recognitions uh, simply because uh, um, there was misconceptions that Kosovo was some sort of American project or European project or a, a project uh, which was somehow incompatible with uh, the interests um, as presented so by our uh, adversary, let's call it that way, Mr. Yedemic, in the anti-lobby campaign that was going on for the last four or five years. Uh, we also became, uh, in November, uh, members of EPRD, European Bank of Social Development, as a sovereign member. Um, 
It was important because it was a long path. We needed two-thirds of the votes for this uh, multilateral organization. And we needed about 10 to 11 uh, non-recognizing votes to accept us as a sovereign member, as a republic of Kosovo. And we got uh, all of North Africa, Tunis, Morocco, uh, then uh, Libya, Egypt, uh, Israel, Slovakia, uh, Greece, which are also EU non-recognizers to vote for the Republic of Kosovo as a sovereign member of EBRD. Um, but most importantly, maybe for the thematics and the theme of today, is that uh, a process which started in 2010. Uh, you remember that in 2010, uh, International Court of Justice uh, made a state uh, opinion uh, you know, on the question posed by uh, UNGA whether Kosovo's declaration of independence was in accordance with international law. Um, uh, the opinion was strongly that yes, it was. Uh, actually, uh, Kosovo uh, Division of Independence did not breach any international law. Uh, and uh, that was a major legal victory uh, for Kosovo's side, uh, support obviously by many countries. I think Norway also delivered uh, a legal opinion on that uh, issue. Uh, but following that uh, specific moment in 2010, uh, in, uh, 2000, in, in September 2010, uh, UNGA uh, created a, uh, approved a resolution which called for a dialogue to start to evaluate in Pristina as a means for both sides to move forward EU. Now, the dialogue was initially a completely technical issue or based on technical issues on how to solve some of the remaining open chapters between the two countries. For example, the fact was that me as a Kosovar, if I wanted to send an SMS in Belgrade or in Serbia, I couldn't because Serbia wouldn't sign any roaming agreement with Kosovo. If I wanted to fly from Pristina to Oslo, I would have to go not in the airspace via Serbia, Hungary, uh, the shortest route, but actually via Bulgaria and Romania, uh, which made my tickets about 85 euros more expensive. Uh, but that's because Serbia wouldn't agree with our airspace and wouldn't recognize our airspace. If I was a um, uh, Kosovo Norwegian and wanted to go for summer holidays in, in Kosovo and wanted to take a, a car ride, again, I could not use Kosovo documents because they wouldn't recognize our Kosovo documents, nor our license plates. So there was a host of issues which were just left after the independence with Serbia being very intransigent during the Kostunica years and not recognizing either implicitly or explicitly the reality on the ground. Uh, which was a very hard line because we understood that, you know, maybe they couldn't immediately recognize the public policy, but not recognizing the reality of the people living there was uh, making a lot of uh, problems uh, in our relationship. So, a uh, technical dialogue that unfolded in, in the subsequent months, uh, we focused on uh, making sure that we solve some of these open, ch open chapters. And as they were being sold, the solved, um, Elections happened in Serbia, uh, a completely new setup came. Mr. Tadic, who was a former uh, spokesperson for Milosevic, as you know, and Mr. Nikolic, who was also a member of uh, Milosevic government and a, a former radical whose president is now uh, for war crimes in, uh, in Hague. Um, uh, it was seen, it was, it, it was evident that we can agree on technical issues, but there are some big questions looming and some big questions unsolved. One big issue is that in north of Kosovo, against international law, in blatant disregard of international law, there were about 600, 700 uh, policemen and security personnel of Serbia, which were there based, somehow providing some sort of services, though, even according to 1244 in 99, or uh, Constitution of Corso, or any kind of legal document, they had no right to be there. And the problem was not that they were there, but that as of 2011, when, for example, we agreed on a purely technical issue, and I'll, get, I'll have to get into the technicalities just so you can understand the context of what happened last 12 months. For example, we agreed that uh, Kosovo custom stamps will be used across Kosovo customs point. And then on the two board northern points, those parallel structures would not accept Kosovo customs stamp because it, said it says Kosovo, and we don't accept it. You won't accept it, you accept it, but these guys didn't. It's clear why they didn't, according to certain sources themselves and UNMIC. Uh, black trade and uh, smuggling uh, was making up to 60 to 70 million euros annually for people who were engaging in those kind of activities in the north. There were two or three forms of, uh, of, of, of uh, smuggling, either withdrawing the VAT from Serbia and reimporting back by taking the profit margin, or it was just basically by not passing any controls and moving things up and down without really any police control. So following um, the situation in which basically you could see that uh, uh, there is a sinkhole uh, in one part of the Kosovo in which income is just disappearing, um, UNMIC, K4, uh, I mean EU, K4, uh, had realized that they have to just start solving this issue. We were very keen to do this. The uh, government of Kosovo Prime Minister Tachi was very keen to move to the point in which we can organize and um, uh, manage the relationship with Serbia in the way um, that are prescribed in Copenhagen criteria. Now, Norway is not a member of EU, and you voted twice against uh, 
and a lot of people say good for you, but uh, uh, we don't have any choice. So we don't have the oil. Uh, we are dedicated 100% to the EU path as the only means for us to survive in the modern world. Uh, not only this old, you know, uh, division of Huntingtonian and clash of civilizations, but also a very practical means of us having a markets uh, uh, relationship and actually every third Kosovar living already in the EU. People, Kosovars are just like Irish 100 years ago, just like Greeks, just like Jews. We have a huge diaspora. Every third Kosovar lives, according to census in 2012, in uh, uh, the, uh, abroad, mostly in Switzerland and Germany. And actually, I'll tell an anecdote. When Germany played Switzerland uh, football uh, with a big victory of Switzerland for the first time in 55 years last year, uh, five out of 11 Swiss players were actually Kosovars. Uh, and when Switzerland played Albania in football, again in Switzerland, um, 60% of all players in the pitch, Albania and Switzerland, were Kosovars. Yeah. Uh, this is because our federation is not recognized, so our players play for, as you know, for Mr. Gashi here and many other football players uh, across Europe. But that's just a digression. Um, we basically realize that we have to move uh, and start solving some of these issues because from customs to many other things, the North was one still one issue which could have just at any given moment inflamed and, and, and make us go backwards in, in, instead of forwards. And as I said, Copenhagen criteria and EU integration, there is something called good neighborly relations. There is something called us being neighbors and being good neighbors, meaning that respect each other, respect the borders, the boundaries, exchange sugar, coffee, you know, whatever people do with the neighbors. And this had to start happening with us in Serbia. Uh, hence, uh, another level of dialogue started, political dialogue. Six meetings happened. Um, Many agreements were reached, uh, and now we are coming really at some sort of not finals because I think it's never finals in this game. And I keep telling you in public debates in Kosovo that our life is going to be one long dialogue. It's never going to end. A dialogue with Serbia, dialogue with Cyprus, dialogue with every single EU member because we have to get ratification, we have to start processes. So uh, it's also a good exercise for us to start learning patience because the EU is about patience, EU integration is about patience. Hence, uh, it was, uh, it was a good way for us to start sort of melting some of the ice that existed and create, entering a new type of situation in Serbia. Um, now we are, uh, Baroness Ashton was uh, lost uh, yesterday in Pristina, uh, and we are looking at um, finally granting full constitutional authority and rights to the north of Kosovo. Um, most points are understood. I think both Serbia understands that they have no means or no ways or no legal possibilities to ever again interfere in the territory of the Republic of Kosovo. This is just impossible. Uh, we also understand that because of EU putting conditions to both sides, uh, last November, very explicit conditions, if they want to move forward and become official candidates and start negotiations and open the chapters, they will have to solve this issue in a way that is uh, basically according to international law and our constitution is deemed so by ICJ. Uh, we are in control of territory, it's a democratic country, there is no doubt about it, uh, and we just want to make sure that uh, what we agreed with Atisari was for extensive decentralized powers. We completely devolved the power to municipalities. Kosovo is not a centralistic state anymore according to our constitution. Municipalities, not only northern, not only Serb, but also Pristina and others, they have rights for it. Primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, healthcare, public services, licensing, uh, trade, uh, and everything uh, that basically except three red lines. And three red lines are municipal budgeting, uh, direct voting, and third one is uh, legislative powers. Those lay uh, with the Parliament of Kosovo. So now we agreed with Serbia that okay, let's enable the northern municipalities, uh, those four and north to have the same type of constitutional uh, powers and, and, and even enhanced ones because in the constitution of Kosovo, Serbian municipalities have another level of extra, uh, of extra rights which are called sort of positive discrimination, you can, you can, you can name it. For example, um, the, the uh, Serbs are 5% of Kosovo population but they actually can go up to 20% of MP seats in the pro Kosovo parliament. There is a deputy prime minister, my boss is a prime minister Tachi, but my deputy boss is uh, Mr. Petrovic, who is the deputy prime minister of Kosovo. And there are uh, numerous uh, ministers and mayors in Kosovo municipalities and ministries which come from the Serbian community. Uh, so these are enhanced powers, uh, but also on the municipal levels there are many others which basically enable uh, for Serbs to feel that they are not being sort of uh, pushed around by Pristina 
in the capital and that they can have their own uh, internal uh, decision making uh, in the way that uh, is basically normal for many uh, functioning uh, democracies in Europe, uh, which are usually decentralized and the power is closest to the citizen uh, and that comes from the municipality. But where we hinge now and where the negotiations are happening and unfolding and maybe next 10 days we will have a final agreement is that Serbia is asking uh, we have an instrument called in our constitution called association for municipalities which means that any single municipality can engage in an association with any, any other municipality if it is for the benefit of implementing what the municipal powers are they cannot have voting for those associations uh, they cannot have uh, executive powers resting with those associations but per se they can for example organize healthcare they can do uh, cultural they can do protection heritage via uh, 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 holistic approach of joining into one association uh, Kosovo municipalities, or, or municipalities already have one such, but the idea was uh, proposed uh, that uh, Serbian municipalities also have their own association in which they can feel that they can cooperate more closely without having uh, to sort of, uh, do too much control from Pristina, which is fine by us because it's actually allowed by constitution. Uh, we made a huge compromise in the United side process. Uh, President decided to propose a pro solution which not many of us liked, which was to grant minorities, extensive rights beyond what uh, was uh, deemed to be for us uh, normal, but uh, uh, quid pro quo was that we get independence, uh, and uh, it was a valid quid pro quo, which uh, we accepted. I think there was a overwhelming support in the Parliament of Kosovo for the side constitution, and you know, there were one million people partying on 17th of February 2008 for the Independence Day, and I think uh, people were very happy with the outcome. Hence, we have to respect the constitution, we have to respect the association, but Serbs now are now asking Serbian government that the association has executive mandate and executive powers. Now, we won't go there. We won't go there because we have a neighbor called Bosnia and Herzegovina, and they do have another unit called Republika Srpska, and according, not to us, but according to our friends in Norway, in EU, in the United States, this is a dysfunctioning state. With all due respect to Bosnia, but it just doesn't work because they have too many vetoes, and at any given point, each side can block the other. Hence, we don't want to go into position of creating units in our country which resemble an uh, already dysfunctioning solution. Uh, again, I, really, I was in Sarajevo last week and we have good relations with the Boston part, but for example, I, it's easier for me to go to Beijing than to Sarajevo. If I go to Beijing, I go to a Chinese office in Beijing, I get the Chinese visa. If I want to go to Sarajevo, there's no way for me to go to Sarajevo because of Republika Srpska not recognized in Kosovo, they, they don't recognize our passports, so I have to go to Skopje, ask for a special permit which is released by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bosnia so I can go to Sarajevo, which is like, you know, 100 kilometers away. So, because we don't want to get into all that type of situations and legal uh, instruments uh, which uh, may community block each other instead of moving forward, uh, we have proposed a deal uh, which I think is uh, according to our constitution, but uh, in, in a very generous manner, uh, sort of uh, supporting uh, extensive decentralized rights. And we do hope, I think Prime Minister had a very good meeting with uh, Espen Barthe Day, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, was alumni here. The director of the NUPI. Not correct. Not the director of research, yes, I remember it from the 1990s. Um, and uh, we have full support of European partners, uh, Norway, NATO partners, for this uh, to happen in a way that will not hamper our future development, but will actually enhance cooperation. I'm optimist, I'm eternal optimist. I really think that we are getting somewhere. If I look where we were five years ago, where we were three years ago, um, Kosovo is currently in a very good position. Uh, of course, transitional country, transitional economy, transitional society. We have issues and problems which are from uh, Vladivostok to Ljubljana and from uh, you know Estonia and even more so in some of our EU partners, uh, very present. Corruption, organized crime, uh, equality of citizens, equality of opportunity for those fighting for their own uh, chance under the sun. Um, but on the other hand, people don't know some things about Kosovo. People don't know that for the last five consecutive years of independence, we had an average of 4 to 5% GDP growth. At the time of the worst financial crisis that hit this planet in the last 100 years. So, and while everybody in the Balkans was having a recession, the recession was going up to 2 to 4 percentage points, we did have growth. And growth was palpable, was visible. Uh, Kosovo is the least indebted country in Europe, except Norway. We have no debt. Our GDP, to, uh, our, our debt to GDP ratio is uh, barely three, four percent. So we don't have this huge billions to pay back to anybody uh, because we started with clean slate, and we are managing a clean slate. Uh, we have not increased our debt in the last five years. Uh, 
for example, we have uh, invested a lot in infrastructure and increase our salaries, public employees, public employee salaries. All the doctors, all the teachers, or every got a fifty, everybody got a fifty percent raise. And people are saying, how do you pay that? You know how? You know, because we, we understand Kosovo is very poor and very this and very that, and you know people have this sort of ninety nine vision of Kosovo, uh, which is stuck rooted because only news you get usually from these regions are bad news, and you don't see Pristina and see that one of the best mojitos you can drink in Europe is in Pristina. And you don't see that the society is actually uh, rather uh, 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 advanced in a way that 73% of all households in Kosovo has a broadband internet. And it's not me saying, the Norwegian government, there's a big NGO called Stick, which is financed by, by Norway, which does a wonderful job in, in uh, promoting IT as a tools of development. And they've done a survey, which has been done backed up by the census of Kosovo, which showed that the vast majority of Kosovars are connected to broadband internet. They have their homes. Um, I can tell you other data, which do, does show that, yes, the society is still struggling because we need to get the next model of growth uh, in the times which are very bad for growth and for creating jobs anywhere in Europe. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have had the biggest growth of our economy uh, in history, except the period 1974 to 1981, when Kosovo got autonomy during Yugoslavia, so there was a big pumping of money from the federal sources and a big growth of industry, but that was a small window which was shut down by the Serbs and the Serbian Republic as soon as we be became sort of middle class and as soon as we started uh, developing a, our own economy. But uh, the fact remains that uh, in 2007, just before independence, I think the GDP per capita was $2,700, and the uh, fact remains that today is uh, more than $4,000, which is a doubling of GDP per capita. So it's not only rich people who got richer, it's actually everybody is better off. People now have more complaints, and it's usual. I'm in politics. Uh, they don't care anymore only for substances. They don't care only, on, only for food at the table. They want to go to holidays. They want to have their kids attend good schools, just like politicians. And people and all the other, uh, they have other requests in their life, and we have to start managing that. We have to start managing expectations, we have to start managing and finding the model of growth which for a small country of 1.8 million people will create the new job opportunities. When I said how did we increase the economy before, it was because we stamped out the grey economy. Kosovo is the only country in all of Europe in the last five years which has had a double digit growth of tax receipts for every, cons every single year in the last five years. So we had every year, we had more than 10% growth of tax receipts. This was not by us taxing more the businesses. We actually decreased the tax and we made it a flat tax rate. Very popular here, but we had to do it because we are competing with other investors in other regions in, in the Balkans. So we have to attract uh, people based on these uh, uh, formulas like flat tax rate and low income taxes and whatnot. But we did manage to increase the tax receipts because uh, there are less and less great economies. Before, 10 years ago, you had a coffee in Pristina and you did not get a new voice. So now you had to get it. Everybody has to get a new voice. So you know that you pay your VAT as a bar or as a service point uh, and that enables us uh, to have more income as a country and we use our income in an interesting way. Uh, new York Times would have said this is a typical Keyn Keynesianism and it was a really Keynesian approach of stimulus economy. We did two things. We increased all the salaries of all public sector employees. 85,000 people got higher salaries. Uh, actually, with all the numbers of prosecutors and doctors and everything, more than 150,000 people got higher salaries. So we spread the wealth uh, that we gained from the more taxes. And then we did another thing. 40% of all our budget went to infrastructure investment. In record time, eight times cheaper than the Sicilian highway, and about four times cheaper than the Belgrade highway, we finished in two years the uh, highway to uh, all the uh, Adriatic coast, to Montenegro and Albania. And basically, 150 kilometers of uh, eight-lane highway were finished, which connected us to the markets, and to the ports in the Adriatic coast in a way that was not possible before. Uh, some of the people here know Albania, know Kosovo, worked in 1999 refugee centers. I see uh, people from Helsinki community that have been there, and they know that it took time from Pristina to Tirana about 11, 12 hours. It took to Montenegro another 12, 14 hours. I have an aunt in Montenegro, and I only visit there every second year because it was too far to drive. It was 12 hours driving, and there were no air flights. But now you arrive in Montenegro in four hours. You arrive in Albania in three hours. This is an amazing new development which will help uh, other businesses because now they have a route for doing business. 
we were looking here for the other developments, and I'll slowly sort of trickle down to a, a Q&A. Uh, for example, I think it's very important, people have not noticed in Balkans, but the top uh, transatlantic pipeline, uh, which was signed, uh, and which Tato in Norway has a big portion from Shah Deniz, uh, bringing gas via uh, Balkans and then to Italy, can potentially have a life-changing consequences for everybody in Balkans, because it brings a, a diversified portfolio of uh, energy supply, uh, cheap energy supply. We are a coal country. We have a lot of coal. We have the second biggest basin of coal in Europe. So we will continue building a new power plant in coal. And I know that a lot of people say, oh my god, coal is very dirty, this and that. But we only are dying of cancer because of we have 1950s and 60s East German plants, and we have to close those. We have to close those because they're dangerous, they're bad, they're polluting us. So in order to close those, we will have a gap of about five, 600 megawatts. So we will build a new plant, hopefully this work will start soon. Uh, but uh, that will still allow us uh, to be uh, overwhelmingly a coal producing or coal energy country, which means that we need to diversify our portfolio. It's a small country, there's no place for solar, there's no place for wind to extensively sort of compensate for the losses. So this thing with TAP uh, can potentially be a very significant for all the Balkans. It also allows us to be a little bit more independent from Russian gas, which through the South Stream is already planning to go via Balkans, Eastern Europe and uh, uh, West Europe. Uh, so these are all new developments which actually, there are two windows, I can really see two, two doors uh, as, as we are in this room. And there's one door in which Serbia and Kosovo does a deal, we enter in a period of good, friendly relations. They don't have to recognize us immediately. West Germany never recognized East Germany. Never. But did they play football together? Yes. Did they have a seat at UN? Both of them, yes. So, legally, West Germany said, no, we will never accept the division, we will never accept. But they still, allowed, they still found a way to communicate, to talk, to exchange, to uh, play, to uh, to have uh, young people uh, visit each other, uh, to sort of function uh, in, in a way that uh, brought uh, uh, stability to, uh, to, to the Germanys. Hence, people in Kosovo say, oh, don't mention two Germanys because they got unified in the end and we will never get unified with Serbia. But I'm not talking about the end result, I'm talking about the process of how they managed to sort of settle the issue uh, uh, while not recognizing each other simultaneously. So we do hope that we will enter this stage, this door in which uh, uh, we get uh, in, in UN, uh, in Council of Europe, and we can deliver to our citizens, maybe not my party, but uh, cons you know, the political powers, the political leaders, and that, uh, that we can get the same benefits that you guys have. For example, a Norwegian, if he feels that he's trampled upon by his own court system, he can always go to European Court of Human Rights. He can always go to, go to the Council of Europe. The Kosovo can't. Kosovars are the only people in 800 million region from Gibraltar to Caucasus, which cannot sue their own government, which cannot sue me, us, if we do something bad to our citizens, because we're not members of the Council of Europe. We do have a two-third majority. We have the possibility of just doing the Palestinian option and ramming our application through, but we don't want to, you know, we want to do it in a consensual, nice, friendly way with everybody on board and be a responsible member of the international community and show that we are part of the multilateral world in which there is interaction and there is quits and there are pros and you know, we can sort of uh, get into it in, in, in a relaxed manner without having to aggravate a situation. Hence, we are engaged in dialogue. I have to say, not very popular dialogue in Kosovo. Some people, and they are not wrong, are saying, why are we talking to Serbia when they have never apologized for attempted genocide? Yes, people do talk, but they talk after apologize, after saying, we are sorry. We are sorry for wrecking your future. We are sorry for wrecking your past. We are sorry for lost, losing 100 years. We are sorry for losing. I was only 12 when Milosevic came to power, 1989. And now it's 2013. We lost 20 years of our life. And I think people should apologize. It's a good first step to say we are aware of what we did. But this did not come from Serbia. They apologize to Srebrenica, they apologize to Vukovar, they apologize everywhere, but not to Kosovo. But we won't be stuck on that moment. We will say, okay, for the future of our children, let's move on and then we'll get back to that point because that point will be opened and the war reparations will be paid because there was a government as sentenced by the Hague Tribunal which has acted upon what it called to be its own citizens, destroying 60% of households, killing 12,000 people, 
and creating a type of situation which was a nightmare for all of the planet because one million people, including my parents, refugees in Norway, were on the run. So that point will be open. But as we are at this point now, let's move forward. So there's the other door in which everything is, uh, you know, Serbia did say no in Rambuye, they did say no in Nafisari process, so it can happen that they will say no now, and then we'll sort of get stuck again in the status quo, and situations can get aggravated, and we cannot move to other issues in Balkans to just close the chapters and start thinking about, you know, TAP and uh, IT and uh, how we can make Balkans a hub of development. And I tell you one thing, if Ireland and Norway and Bangalore and Singapore, which were all dirt poor. People were dying of hunger. People in Norway had ate potatoes and drank potato liquor and went to the United States. In the United States, they had great success. They had Walter Mondale and they had all sorts of senators and Congress people and they had a very good job, but they were poor. You know, we used to the poor. But they made it. Singapore, when it became independent, they said, this place is horrible. This is dirt, small speck of land, has no chance to become independent. No chance. They found a niche, they found financial markets. Their budget is now 650 billion annually. They are the biggest financial hub in, in, in look at Ireland. Until very recently, a very poor country. They fixed the tax system, they focused on education, education and education. And despite of the crisis they had with the banking sector, which was a, not a similar type of crisis elsewhere in Europe, like Greece with debt, it was a different type of crisis, but they still had a type of growth and type of explosion of entrepreneurship and they had Google and they had Microsoft and they had sort of things that, that really, and EU brought some of that, granted, but I think Balkans can be that, can be the next island, can be the next Bangalore. Look at the Indians, they were in Silicon Valley, you know, they, they started producing software and they said, why am I staying in California, it's expensive, let me go back to India, it's more cheaper there, labor force, people know math, we can do coding, we can produce the same stuff that we produce in California, we can do in India, we can have bigger profits. And I'm sure that actually this same thing can we just have to tweak a little brains and do more education, education, and education, nothing else about education, especially for countries like Kosovo, which is young, and, and, and enter into a phase of where Balkans after, you know, we celebrated last year, we didn't celebrate, we commemorated last year, 100 years of Balkan wars, but in which we can get to the moment of really being a hub of stability and growth and progress. Uh, Kosovo has some other good sides, it's a progressive constitution, progressive country. You don't expect that, but we are the only country in Balkans in which our constitution grants full uh, rights for all categories in which ethnicity and sexual orientation is exactly the same. Hence, uh, LGBT community and Albanians and whoever are granted the same powers and the same protection. I think that's a brave move which was occurred by our political system. You could not find that in Serbia, you don't find that in Macedonia or our neighbors. There are some other solutions but I will not dwell into those details in order to allow for some Q&As. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for a very good talk, both on the current debates and the wider context of how Kosovo is evolving. Uh, you are right, uh, not only Kosovo, but the Balkans in general tend to on the region of region news and the bad news, unfortunately. And uh, those of us who follow events more closely are Happy to get the opportunity to have you here to, 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 to explain to us, to describe what's going on before. Um, I'll open the floor, but I will I will exploit my, my position at the chair to ask the first question, if please. Okay. Um, the dialogue is taking place on the highest political level, which is good because then you have a top-down uh, enforcement of what's being uh, agreed. At the same time, uh, in all of these discussions about the relative topics, as long as I've been involved, I'm the, the always been a question about the people on the ground, especially then the Kosovo Serbs, who often feel that things are being decided above their heads, <coughs> and they, they therefore wouldn't accept it. And uh, of course, if you're going to have a deal that's going to be sustainable, they need to almost be buy into what's being agreed, and I read the news yesterday, they were already saying something about the topic that's being How do you go about resolving that? In 2004, um, we had a situation. There was a blockade, a barricade, but one similar to the barricade which have now in North, which was connecting the road of Pristina and Skopje uh, at the village called Dachanica, uh, where the famous monastery is. And uh, a situation aggravated by that specific incident, and then related to some other incident in North in which three kids died, and then all of a sudden we have you know, a few thousand uh, Kosovars running amok, uh, 
burning churches, uh, going into revenge mode. Uh, some of that was misused by the or just vandals and criminals and hooligans. Uh, and I had, I remember, Norwegian K4 was up in the Gratalisa protecting uh, the, 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 the area there. And people were saying in Pristina, oh my god, but this is what I Just outside Pristina, we have this area, and, and, and they can block us whenever they want, and it can be a cause of. Well, lo and behold, today, people from Pristina go to Gratalisa to do shopping. Uh, Gratalisa has a Serbian mayor, uh, it has higher participation in elections than it ever had in their Serbian elections. Serbs feel integrated. Well, there are problems, there are issues, as there are in every transition. But you could see that the model of decentralizing the power, according to Atisari, functions if you give people opportunity. If the mayor has chance to hire, fire people, build roads, build schools, have uh, income, have taxes, that's pretty much it. People feel secure. He doesn't feel threatened by Krishna because Krishna has no means to threaten him. Uh, he actually feels rather good in a new situation because you have all this because of our business people who are looking at Gratianisa as a possibility for expansion of their business because it's so close to Pristina, it's our New Jersey. To, it's like New Jersey to New York. Uh, and you go to Sterbse in skiing resort. We just had a road show in Aspen and, uh, and uh, I think uh, in Italy. We are planning to build a major new uh, skiing center and it's 99% served. But do we go skiing there? Yes. There was a snowboard competition with 150 participants from Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Kosovo, only last week, sponsored by the Norwegian government and us. Uh, and kids were having fun doing snowboarding. Uh, and was there any problem that it was a Serbian municipality? No. So I think if we allow for the process to decriminalize the North by taking out the parallel structures and mafia, if we allow for the due process of the democratic election of the mayors, people will have opportunity to have their own life. And then you will just see by itself that, you know, once they can hire and fire people, once they have their own police people in certain language, once they have a, a legitimate uh, uh, identity close to their uh, center, which is Mitternica, I think things will look much more relaxed because we have a track record. We have proof. We're not talking fantasy land. We're talking something which works. It doesn't work perfectly, but it works. It, it's, it's a good first step. Secondly, it has to trickle down. Yes, I love my Prime Minister for speaking and being brave and meeting uh, Prime Minister of Serbia and President Yahyagam and the President Nikolic without them apologizing, I repeat. But uh, it has to trickle down. It has to make sure that other civil society supports it, the opposition supports it. One of the coolest projects I've ever seen was a German youth foundation after the Second World War. They enabled five million kids to France to travel from France to Germany, from Germany to France in order to sort of create a type of different atmosphere after three wars that they waged upon themselves. And if French and Germans can do it, I don't see why we can't do it. Ambassador Broto is here, and he is well, an exceptional ambassador in, in the diplomatic corps in Pristina, and has been a good friend of Balkans for the last 13, 14, 15 years, even more possibly. And uh, he supports a lot of youth projects, and Norway has been supporting a lot of youth projects, and a result of Norwegian support of youth projects. Uh, and I think we have to do more, work more, uh, I think a lot of people in Belgrade don't understand what Krishna is. Some of them have racist opinions. And I have to be very frank with you. When something is not very popular, not very politically correct. But I was in South Africa many times. And uh, in South Africa, some white people, if they get a bit drunk, they're going to say, these blacks always have power. I can't stand it. And they do say that. And they move out of South Africa because after 100 years of apartheid, they can't stand for the majority to have the power of the minority when the minority had all the power for so long. And I have to say that some Serbs in Kosovo might not like the fact that now majority has the power. They do have extensive protection of their minority rights, but they possibly just have racist attitudes, and they can't stand for Albanians to have the power after 100 years of subjugation to terror. You have those Serbs. I'm sorry, but you have. In Kosovo, Serbs have voted cons for 12 consecutive years for Milosevic, Sheshek, and Arkan. All three of them were in, in war criminals, died in jail or are in jail. They never voted for Djindjic, they never voted for Drashkovic, they never voted for any of the liberal elite in Belgrade, because they were in the hinterland. So some of that is understandable and explainable, and I understand it. I, I don't want to sort of say that everybody's like that, because I do have a lot of Serbs friends in government and in Kosovo and in and in Serbs, but some of them just will not accept it. And I'm sorry, but it's their problem, it's not my problem, it's not Kosovo government problem. They don't like it, they can leave. But those who like it, 
and those who want it, no one in Kosovo can make them legal. Kosovo shall never be free until every Serb is free to speak his own language, to move anywhere in Kosovo, and to do whatever they want in Kosovo. So that is an important message we have to give on a daily basis to them in order not to allow for people to feel that uh, they don't get anything out of the dialogue.